Hi, Amos. Here we are. I think we're on. Uh, if you guys can see us and hear us, fine. Let us know. We want to make sure we check our volume yesterday. Check, had check. A, volume. a little bit low on my on my mic, so uh, let us know in the comments. Did you, you tell you if, if people are watching or what? Where does it show us numbers? Uh, yeah, top corner it shows. Uh, it shows we got some people on the live Facebook group. So far, mm -hmm. happy Thanksgiving. Richard, you're the first person on to comment that I can see. Can you tell us if you can hear us fine? Oh, wanna, yeah, okay. Uh, Sorry, I had it on private chat. Now it's comments. Now I can see everybody. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. What's up, everybody? Good to my, see uh, your beautiful uh, tags. Let me just introduce myself. I'm Adam Henkel with the Makers Mob, and this is the Samurai Carpenter. Uh, you guys, let us know if you can hear us. You are distorting. Do I need to turn down? Yeah, I told you your freaking mic was hot or whatever. It's got the... I can turn down a bit. Yeah, just mellow it, mellow it out a bit. Welcome, everybody. Looks like there's a good posse here. That's pretty sweet. Adam is underwater, hey? Yeah, you do sound like you're underwater. That's that's the perfect analogy. I was trying Sounds to use. Good. Richard says Adam not sounding too good. Ha! Huh. I don't know if I can do anything at this point about that. Uh, all I can try is. But I sound I'm... I sound amazing, right? I always sound amazing. It's peaking. Or on the moon, that's fine. I tried to turn it down a little bit. Why don't you just plug, your, plug in some Apple earbuds? I've, Apple products just make the world easier. I know, I don't have any here. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're amazing. Okay, so we've got a couple highly distorting. Okay, you know what? It is bearable though. At least we'll have it a little bit bearable today. And the reality is is that you want to listen to, to Jesse more than me anyway, so. yeah. We, pl good. we planned it that way so that his voice sounds really annoying and then he'll just ah. gen gently ask questions and then I'll do all the talking. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so uh, we have people here from YouTube that are watching live and then we have people here in the private uh, Teachers Maker Series on the private Facebook group. If you want to join the private Facebook group, uh, we're giving away prizes in that group. Uh, if you're on YouTube, you won't be able to get those prizes. There's a link in the description below on YouTube that you can click through and join uh, join that group. We've got, uh, we had Jimmy Duresta live on Monday. We had John Peters uh, live on Tuesday. Yesterday, I did a talk on Project Assembly. And then today we have Jesse the Samurai Carpenter. You can watch all those videos uh, in that private Facebook group if you go, if you go there. So. Um, so today we're going to be talking about how to prepare lumber for your next project. Um, we're going to start at the very beginning of, you know, milling up your own wood, work uh, or talk about going to the lumber yard, what you're looking for, uh, things to watch out for, and then right into the shop, what to do with rough lumber, how to dimension it, um, some unique situations like large timbers, uh, how to how to mill up a slab, flatten it, uh, things like that. So we got lots lots going to happen here uh yeah it's thanksgiving in the state in america in america we're in canada we already had our thanksgiving but happy thanksgiving to all our american brothers and yeah. sisters like they're joining us it's three o'clock eastern so there's people joining us on their thanksgiving day how does that make you feel jesse that people came to join you it makes me feel very thankful very thankful. <laughs> See what um, I did there? I like it because it's Thanksgiving. It, it makes sense. All right, let's get into it. So uh, let's start off. We've been asking people in the private Facebook group this week their favorite tools and their favorite wood or material to work with. So we'll start off asking the samurai carpenter his thoughts on that. My favorite hand tool is this. Many of... Um, People that have been following me for a while already know this because I just go on and on and on about what a great hand plane this is. This is the Veritas Jackrabbit. Um, 
because you see what they did there with the play on words? It's uh, it's a jack plane, but it's also rabbits. So they called it a jack rabbit. It's genius, ah. genius marketing right there. Um, it's just the most versatile plane on on the market today. It's got like an adjustable mouth. Uh, so you can do some aggressive work with it if you want. It's got little uh, carbide knicker blades. So if you're cutting across the grain and you don't want to tear out the wood, you can drop those little knicker blades down and they'll score the wood on either side of the blade. Um, it also has attachments for, uh, for a fence that comes with it. And then you can attach a fence to do different angles and stuff like that, planing miter faces. Uh, it's low angle, so it can cut um, end grain quite easily. And you can also get a secondary blade you want and then sharpen it at a higher angle to achieve like a smoothing plane kind of status. So um, the, the cutting angle or the bevel angle will adjust. You can, you can change out the blades so that it becomes really functional. It also has a handle that you can unloosen this screw and the handle can tilt in either direction. So if you're trying to plane into a corner and you don't want to rip your knuckles open on a piece of, uh, you know, the woods, you know, coming up right here, you can just cant the handle out of the way uh, in either direction. So they, they pretty much thought of everything. There's also tiny little set screws that hold uh, the blade in place. So when you put your blade in after sharpening it, it's right back in the perfect uh, parallel position with the edges of the sole. So it, it's just... It's just a, a masterful work of art, this tool. And if you're kind of like, oh, there's so many hand planes, which one do I buy? This is the one that you buy. It's pretty much like five planes in one. Um, how much How much does that go for? I think it's it's about uh, like 400 Canadian pesos. But uh, worth every peso. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it, it's Canadian, so it's cheaper for you Americans out there. Um, and uh yeah it's just it's just a phenomenal plane and then i also brought up my my baby my uh hand forged japanese tasai chisel that i got to buy directly from japan or uh, tasai the, the blacksmith maker when i was in japan and it's kind of like one of his higher end models and it's just it's just a work of art not only to use but to look at and just hold and gently caress but yeah fantastic so, yeah, those are my favorite favorite two hand tools right there um what would be the wood of choice for you if you're going to build a project and you could pick any wood what would you use oh that's such a cliche cliche question um <laughs> different, different woods work for different situations right so i i love i'm all about diversity and I just, I love it all. <laughs> okay, but hardwoods is obviously ideal for furniture. Uh, you know, the classic white oak, Cortison white oak is pretty beautiful to, to work with and um, easy to chisel, easy-ish to plane. Um, I just built my rocking chair out of Sapili though, which is an exotic hardwood, and I really enjoyed using that. It's a little more like prone, prone to splitting and chipping a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's just such a beautiful wood. And every wood just has I don't know, such characters. But my, I'd say my one of my go-tos is cherry. Um, as far as like balance of price, aesthetics, and workability, I would say cherry is pretty dreamy. It ages really well, too. It kind of starts out light. Uh, when you plane it up and use it, but then once you're um, once you've finished the piece and oiled it or whatever, it continues to darken and kind of develop more depth and and beauty in the grain as it gets exposed to sunlight and stuff like that. So I do love the cherry. It's kind of like this unfolding story. Like it doesn't just stay the same color once you once you finish a project. It gets richer and richer as time goes by. So I like cherry for that. Um, yeah. But, you know, I'm not partial. But for me, it's always kind of a balance of, like, is this going to cost me a bajillion dollars? Like, walnut is insanely expensive where I live. It's about four, $14 plus dollars a board foot. Um, so I can I just can't justify spending, you know, $600 on, like, three boards of walnut that will, like, make a, you know, 
a small coffee table or something like that. Uh, so like that, that to me is like, I would love to work with more Walnut, but it's so expensive where I live. So I kind of come up with different options. You know, cherry is less than half the price of Walnut. So, wow. so that's why I kind of stick with, with cherry most of the time. But I was also did a few projects in beach and I really, I enjoyed working with the beach. It's a bitch to plane, uh, pardon my French, but, um, it's a really like solid hardwood, not excessively like beautiful in the grain or anything, but it's nice to work with. It's nice and you know stable and and got some good density to it. Awesome. Well, that's that. I mean, that was a long answer for such a cliche question. <laughs> and that's what I'm saying. Like you can't just be like, "Oh, my favorite wood is blah blah blah." It's like every wood has different qualities and, and yeah. negative positives and negatives. It's just kind of like which one do you want to deal with, right? Yeah. Um, so just to, to bring it up again, if you guys just joined us, we have two audiences here. One is on YouTube live and the other is in a Facebook, a private Facebook group uh, that is live in there. It is for a maker's teacher series that we've been doing all week. If you want to join that group, just click the link below uh, in the description if you're on YouTube um, and you can get in on that. Uh, so we're going to get into the actual kind of discussion today about preparing your wood. Let's just briefly talk about uh, milling wood yourself, kind of your experience with that, what you think about it, is it worth it? Um, I've got a little video that we will will play here and you can just talk over it and explain kind of your thoughts just about milling your own wood. Um, I will say that uh, there's just a lot more involved with milling your own wood than you think. Um, and I was quite naive, despite having been raised in kind of a construction background and having worked with many, you know, custom or portable saw millers and stuff like that. Um, it's an insane amount of work, lab physical labor. Uh, if you're not in good physical health, like, just forget it. You'll be in the hospital pretty quickly. <laughs> with back issues if you're trying to do it manually um there's yeah like you need to have hydraulic power really to be able to mill wood efficiently so you need to have a forklift or a tractor or uh you know a little backhoe or something to load and offload logs especially if you're cutting large timbers um i was like oh this will be great i'm gonna mill this stuff and i put a you know a log on there and then it's like once you mill it to like an eight by eight and it's like six you know 16 feet long or something like that you can't lift that off by yourself you need like three four guys and and who can afford to have three people standing around right so it was just kind of like i i just realized like logistically i was just not um prepared uh, to be to be milling okay. wood milling wood efficiently so you, you just like lifted that uh oh we're going to the next one here you just lifted that uh that log yourself like all the way up there you obviously had some yeah like, like you can, you can get little winches and stuff like that mill had and, and it works but it's just so so slow and um yeah you you want to you got to have a tractor handy and most you know, some of you guys are like yeah duh, you didn't know that and and it's like yeah yeah it's just true because i find that there's there's um it's like voluntary uh delusion i find with woodworking where you you see something happen in a video or or you know you see some ad for like getting a sawmill and you go oh they make it look so easy and and uh you're kind of like i'll be able to do that and oh i'll just rig up something that'll make that simple and it's kind of like a, it's like the physics realm like you can't you just can't get around certain problems without having to exert insane amounts of energy and so a lot of people get into woodwork and they're like, oh, well, he spent $5,000 on that. Well, I can just get this thing from Home Depot and it costs $73 and I'm sure it'll do the same thing. And it's like, mm, no, it doesn't do the same thing. Uh, you pretty much get what you pay for and anybody trying to do woodworking on the cheap is going to quite quickly realize that eh, it's just not one of those cheap hobbies. Not if you want to do a good job. And, and, and so, yeah, it's, it's, you learn a lot of hard lessons, but you know, that, that's life you know hard lessons lots of failure and you just keep rolling along and so if you're down if you're down with just you know embracing the fail as i like to call it uh you will eventually become a good woodworker uh but yeah the shortcuts 
they're just they just don't really work in in many respects and i and i learned that a lot quite quickly when i tried to mill my own wood so i leave that to the professionals now but i do hope to have a sawmill one day when i have a, a property of my own that has like trees and stuff on the property but as far as like trying to go out and find logs and get logs and bring them back to your sawmill or whatever store them mill them yourself it's it's a great workout you know it'll keep you in shape if you're looking for you know looking for for to burn some calories uh and that's, and, and that's really a full-time job in it in itself right like getting yeah it's not something you can just kind of dabble in unless you have like a you know a farm property and the mill is just kind of sitting there you know typically you want to have it under cover too or else the rain and the snow and everything just wreaks havoc on the machine and uh so yeah like if you have a tractor and you got a property and you know you're taking down trees on your property then that makes sense but if you're like you know living in the suburbs and you're like i could fit this thing in my driveway um i don't recommend jumping into milling until you maybe maybe go work with like a portable saw miller for a couple of weekends or months and stuff like that and get a feel for it before you go dropping money on it like i did um yeah. but yeah lessons uh, learned awesome so the next the next thing let's just touch a bit on when you i mean so you just kind of ruled out your thought process on milling it yourself you're going to the lumber store now you're getting lumber let's just talk about things that you look for when you're selecting wood uh what you try and stay away from uh, so put yourself in the mindset like you're going into the lumber yard and you're going to pick a bunch of of lumber to bring back for projects so kind of walk us through your mindset and what you're looking for there yeah so i'm not really um I find like a lot, I run into a lot of people like on these com in community groups where it's like they're really, um, I don't know what the type is, but they're like, you know, very organized and make a list and I need to have like, what's the exact board footage and all this sort of stuff. And, and I'm not that type of person. I'm a much more just improvised freestyle, go for it. And, um, you know, I'll take seven trips to the hardware store because I forgot seven things that I should have got the first time. Um, and I think that's just in my genetics because my dad's the exact same way. And, uh, and so I, I you know, I, I roll that way, but it's also really hard when you go to the lumber store because, um, uh, especially if we're talking about, um, like hard, like picking out hardwood for a project, right? Like to build yeah. a piece of furniture. Yeah. So yeah. not, we're not talking about like Home Depot. This is like a hardwood supplier, right? So the hardware suppliers where I live, um, and, and I think this is pretty similar across the board um at least in north america is you go to a hardware supplier and they just have these huge lifts of different types of wood right maple oak whatever and uh and it'll come in like different thicknesses right so four quarter would be so four one quarter inch right one inch so they call it four quarter two inch thick is called eight quarter and you know six quarter is inch and a half right it's pretty self-explanatory that way so um i always get my wood you know so if four quarter wood one inch thick hardwood or hardwood will typically be rough sawn sometimes they'll run it through a sander or a planer so you'll you'll have that full one inch thickness some of it will still have all the saw marks on it from the sawmill so you're going to be removing a lot of that material so four quarter material actually only makes three quarter boards and vice versa right so six quarter material would only make inch and a quarter thick boards or one inch boards depending if it has big cup or crown and that sort of stuff so you have to like account for a lot of waste uh when you're milling wood from like rough sawn hardwood um so yeah like the most that i typically can get out of an eight quarter two inch thick board would be an inch and three quarters so you lose at least a quarter sometimes more um so and then the boards in the pile they're not all two by fours right they're not like a dimensional wood that you get from a lumber yard um they're all different widths depending on the species of wood right so when people are like how many board feet do i need well i'm like well technically you need this amount of board feet if you want to do the calculations but when you're at the store you can't just be like well i got you know 27 board feet because that's all i needed you typically want to get more and you want to get different widths right because you might be like well i don't want my tabletop to be like a bunch of three inch boards i'd like it to be in like three really wide 10 inch boards right and so you kind of have to go through a whole pile and then be like oh well this one is wide enough um, but it's going to be more than I need. And so you'd have to buy it anyways, right? Because it's like, I, I'm always thinking about the aesthetics of the piece, right? And I go, okay, well, this board and this board are going to make the top of the table because they have some really cool figure in it. And I, I like that. And I want to feature that kind of a thing, right? And then 
and then I have to get so many other boards for the legs. And so you kind of want to get it like close to like, so that you're not wasting a bunch of material when you're, when you're milling it down. Um, so like if my legs are going to be three inches, you know, square, I would, I would get six inch boards or typically seven inch boards by the time you joint them down and, and plane them, they're going to be about six inches wide. And then you cut that in half and glue it together to make, you know, a three inch square piece. Right. So I'm always just thinking in terms of like, how do I break stuff down? How much waste there's going to be? Maybe it's 15, 20%, maybe it's 10%. I don't know. Like, um, if the boards are really cupped and crooked and twisted, then you lose more and more material. Right. So I typically just go to the yard and I buy like more than I need, like, you know, 20, 30% more. And so that way I know, like, if I screw a piece up, I've got another piece there. Right. But a lot of people are like, oh, I need to save the money and do this as cheaply as possible. And I'm just like, mm, it's going to be hard, hard to do that. <laughs> You'll, you know, be spending more money, like running back to the hardware store and gas you know, to get that one board that you should have just bought the first time around, but you were trying to save the extra 50 bucks and, you know, whatever, right? So for me, it's like I, I'll kind of go through the pile and I'll have my tape with me and I'll just pick up boards and I'll stack them together and be like, okay, this is enough boards for the tabletop and the cutoffs of these boards will be enough for the legs and I just kind of work my way through and then I just grab a couple extra boards just for safe measure and then uh, you typically can't return the wood, but I've never wanted to return hardwood in my life. So, um, um, yeah, I, I just put it on the pile if I don't use it. And I go, ah, that'll make something down the road. And that's how you get a giant collection of random pieces of hardwood like I have. There you but go. I'm, I'm quite happy about it. Um, so someone mentioned in the comments about my audio. Apologize for my audio. If it, Some people are saying it's good. Some people are saying it's bad. So, I mean, there's nothing that we can do at this point uh, now that we're live. But um you want to hear jesse the samurai carpenter anyways so uh i'll try and talk as little as possible uh so let's just say you've got your lumber you've taken it back to the shop now jesse what what do you do to start dimensioning your wood what's the first step um i wish i had my little like whiteboard here i could draw i i'm good at visualizing i'll i'll talk you through it uh i'm gonna just I'm going to play this. Just, it's just Okay. So I find like, depending on the, you know, the, the hardwood stock itself, uh, hopefully you go through the pile and you don't pick out a bunch of hockey sticks um, that are crooked and, and curved, but a lot of it, it when it's rough sawn, it, it'll have a crown to it um, or it'll have some twist to it, but the, the wood is beautiful and you're like, well, I can, I can still get what I need out of it. So the way I do that. So first things first is I, I usually hit the joiner, right? So, I bring my wood in, I dump it down on my kind of assembly table, which is right next to my joiner. And um, if the wood is really crooked and, and got some weirdness to it, I will, in order to minimize the amount of waste, I try to rough cut boards to lengths first, right? So I'll need so many pieces for my legs that are going to be three feet long or whatever, right? And uh, what that does is say you have a board, right? And it's got a big crown in it or it's got a, a twist or something like that, um, and say it's 10 feet long, and it's got a half inch crown or whatever, every time you cut that board in half, you, you reduce that crown by half, right? And so if you cut that into three, you know, three foot pieces, you know, the crown is gonna be like an eighth or three sixteenths as opposed to a half inch over the whole board, right? So I find that um, like cutting, to rough lengths, I usually will cut within like two inches. I give yourself a few inches extra on each piece. And then I will take it to the joiner so that I'm not having to run an insane amount through the joiner and I'm losing like a, a lot of width, right? But occasionally you, you have big pieces like that and you and you do the whole big piece because you're making a tabletop or in this case was my workbench, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I kept the pieces long because my workbench is about eight feet long or something like that. Um, so yeah, sometimes you can't avoid it, but wherever you can rough cut to length first, do that. Sure, you're going to be handling a lot more smaller pieces, so it's a little bit more running around the shop, but ultimately you're wasting less material and uh, way less sawdust in your shop kind of a thing. Uh, so so yeah, that's what I recommend for, for not wasting all that preciously expensive hardwood is to rough cut it to length, then you hit it to the joiner. I'll usually joint the edges first, 
once I've jointed the edges, a lot of times the boards that I buy are too wide for my joiner, which is a, an eight inch wide capacity. And so I'll rip the boards to length and I'll also add, add usually a quarter of an inch extra width to what your final dimension is. Don't like, you know, you might be like, well, I've got a straight edge and I'm going to rip this down to three inches now because I need a bunch of three inch boards. And you rip, what happens with hardwood is because hardwood trees typically have these long, heavy branches, right? They, they, as they grow, there's an insane amounts of internal stress in that wood, right? To support these huge branches. And you don't know where that stress is hiding because you just see a straight board, right? That's been milled and, and it's dry and it's, it's stable. But when the moment you split that board in half, you'll notice well, a lot of times on the table saw, anybody who's, who's tried to rip old hardwood stuff, it, as you're ripping it, it's pinching the blade because you're releasing the, the stress in those fibers of wood by cutting them and, or it's pulling away, like it's gapping out. And all of a sudden you'll rip a board that you had just run through the joiner and had a straight edge. And then the moment you ripped it and then you look down at it again, now it has like an eighth of an inch crown in it. And you're like, what the heck? And uh, so you always want to rip an extra, you know, quarter of an inch is usually safe as far as width, because a lot of times you have to take it back to the joiner and re straighten these, those edges, especially when you're ripping wider boards into smaller sections. I find that very rarely does it, the hardwood not move at all. Typically is there, there's always, you know, some sort of crown or warp that comes out of it. So then once I rip my boards to piece widths that are smaller than the eight inches, then I take them back and I'll joint them on the face, right? The flat face. And once I have a straight edge and a straight uh, flat face, then I'll take them over to the planer and thickness them and, and run them through the planer and get them down to final dimension that way. So nice. um, let, let me just ask you a specific question about when you are uh, flattening let's say just like a standard kind of six inch board, if it's cupped, what do you do? Do you put like cup up, cup down, and do you plan it, join it first? Yeah, typically if I can get, I'll, I'll put the, the cup down because then, then the kind of the edges of the cup are registering on the table and it doesn't want to wobble as opposed to if you put the, the cup the other way, it'll kind of want to wobble, teeter-totter on you a little bit and it's hard to keep that steady. So yeah, I'll usually put the cup down and then start running that through. And then once you have it onto the outfeed table of the joiner where it's now got a flat surface, you, I always keep my pressure on the outfeed table. You don't want to keep all your weight on the infeed as you're pushing it through. You got to have to at, at the beginning, right? And then as you get, you know, a couple feet onto the outfeed table, I kind of shift my weight to keep the pressure on the outfeed table and yeah. then just keep drawing the wood through that way. And that, that typically works. Some guys, will, um, but for like a crowned edge, some people, instead of like taking off the ends and keeping the crown down, they'll flip it around so that the crown is like kind of belly down on the on the edge. And then they find that that's a little easier to run through the joiner. Some guys swear by that direction. I've tried both. And I typically, I typically, I don't, it, it's not such a big deal for, for the edges of the board. But when you're doing a flat board, I always kind of put the cup down because it's just oh. easier to kind of keep your weight on it and not have it rock and move on you. So the crown crown edge, that's like what you're like a, a bowed or curved edge, right? You're yeah. About? Yeah. yeah so like when it has would, a you ever, would you ever put that, like try and clean that up on the table saw first just to get it closer to flat and then run it through the joiner? Or? If it's really bad, sometimes like, like say like it's got a big like bow or crown, whatever you call it on the edge. Um, I'll like hold it on the joiner and I know like, oh, it's going to be a quarter of an inch or, or, or more. And I'll kind of zip it through. And then as soon as the wood blade stops biting, instead of like pushing the board through continually and then getting another little bite at the end where it's, you know, the crown's coming down at the end, the end of the board, I'll like just pull it back and I'll do a couple of little passes just on that front section, just to knock mm -hmm. down that high point or whatever. And then, and, and then do like one full pass through as opposed to like, cause sometimes you'll be like, Zzz! And then it'll cut like the first six inches and then they won't be cutting anything. And you're like pushing this long board and then zzz, at the end. Right. So I just kind of just save myself the effort of like running the whole board through like 10 times. I'll just like keep pulling it back and keep nipping down that one edge, the front edge until it gets closer to the, the width of the board in the middle. And then once I have full bite on the blade, then I push it all the way through kind of thing. So, gotcha. um, if you so pretty much in dimensioning you i mean in your shop you have your your uh joiner your planer and your table saw uh 
is what are some other ways, like if people don't have a joiner, can you think of, I know Jimmy Dresses talked about this the other day of like getting a straight piece of like plywood or MDF and like screwing your board down and running that straight edge of the plywood against your table saw fence and then like cutting that, uh, that board straight. Is there any other ways like with routers or something else that you would suggest for people who don't have the tools that you maybe have? Um, well, like the router sled for like flattening big planks or like wide slabs, uh, live edge slabs and stuff like that is, oh, it's super messy. Um, but it's the only way you're actually going to get like a good uh, quality finish or product. Like you're, it's actually going to work. Um, like a start planing. Instead of like having a joiner or a planer, uh, yeah. t the table saw trick, like Jimmy was saying, that's been around for ages, and uh, it works as far as getting a straight edge. Say you want to glue boards together and, and you don't have a joiner, um, you can get fairly straight there. You'll still have to fart around with a hand plane typically a little bit um, when you do it, unless your table saw and your jig is really, you know, dead dead straight and really attached to that straight board that you run through the table saw, and, and you got like a nice sharp blade so it doesn't really leave you like a rough rough um face to to glue to the next board then then that works fairly well um like if you don't have a joiner you have to have a joiner plane like a big long body joiner hand plane to do edges um i to try and flatten faces with a joiner plane like unless you're one of those real um hardcore hand tool guys that just is a glutton for punishment um or you love just excessive amounts of exercise then that's just not not gonna cut it and and so many people are like oh there's got to be another way i can't afford a joiner and i'm like i can go and use facebook um and marketplace and find to use six inch joiners for like two, three hundred dollars. And I'm like, if you can't afford a three hundred dollar tool, uh I try I'd I'm just not one of these like uh well uh, let's do what you can't afford. Like uh, you, maybe just woodworking is not for you. Um th that's kind of like what I say because I'm just like uh, I've tried to do woodworking as cheaply and affordably as I can my entire life. And I've still spent like probably a hundred thousand dollars on tools, you know, over, you know, 15 or 20 years, uh, maybe not that much. I was kind of like trying to add it up in my shop the other day. And, and it, I was like with hand tools and all my machinery, I was into the $60,000 range. And I don't have, like, I, you know, I buy nice tools, but not like the best of the best by any means. I could have spent twice as much and I got really good deals on all of my tools because I bought them used even my big machines um, I got them for like 50% of retail pricing and they were hardly used and so um, for me it's like there where there's a will there's a way but you're going to have to spend some money and you can find great deals but great deals doesn't mean you're going to get like a $5,000 planer for like $500 um, maybe if you buy it from like a junkie who's stolen it and they're just trying to get offloaded. You might get it for 500 bucks, but um, typically machines hold their value pretty well. So this is the only other option here. What you're seeing is me doing my router sled. It's, uh, it makes a crazy amount of dust, but it's a joiner and a planer. So it's flattening and taking out any twist as well as thicknessing by removing, you know, whatever desired amount of material you want. And so you can, you know, in an hour or an hour and a half, typically is what it takes, you know, time lapse is obviously sped it up significantly. It's about, you know, 40 minutes per side to, you know, take off a good quarter inch thickness and remove any twist and that sort of stuff. And so you got to set up the jig and, and you can see my shop. It just literally covers the six inches of sawdust on the floor um, because you're removing so much material, but that's actually the, probably the most efficient way to do it because you can take off like a quarter of an inch with, yeah. a, with a sharp router bit, you know, thickness, which, you know, a planer, you can only do a 16th at a time. So you're essentially like, you know, four or five passes through a planer you can do in one pass with a router sled. So, so that's the only way I can think of dimensioning like large timbers. You can still, you could also do that router sled on small timbers or multiple small timbers if you had them all laid out beside each other. So that's mm -hmm. the only kind of way to do it, but it requires space and makes an insane amount of mess. 
Um, and typically after you've done that, you know, a handful of times, you're going to be like, I, I'm just going to go buy a planer. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of what woodworking does to you. If you stick with it, you, you reach these breaking points where you're just like, that's it. Like, I love woodworking. I'm not quitting, but I'm going to buy this tool. And I, I put all mine on the credit card, you know, like when I first started, because I was like, oh, these tools are somebody's selling them for super cheap. And I, I have to buy the ball because I'm never going to see them this cheap again. And I don't have money and credit line. Boom. And so I'm, st I'm, st I'm sure I'm still paying off my tools because I still have a balance on my credit line. But but they're worth it was worth every penny, in my opinion. So uh, you can find six inch joiners used quite often for $300 or less, which if you buy a, a new pan plane, it'll cost you more than that. Uh, so for some people, I'm just like, you're not looking hard enough. You might have to get in your car and drive four hours. A lot of people in our, in our Facebook group are like, you know, I'm getting in the car and I'm doing a six hour road trip to go get this table saw. That's, you know, way cheaper than I can find anywhere else. And it's a great old saw, right? And they'll drive, you know, all through the night or whatever to go pick up a table saw and bring it back because they want to save, you know, 500, 600 bucks or, or more sometimes. So it's like, you got to kind of have that get her done mentality where you're just like, I'm going to go find a deal. I'm going to keep my eyes and ears open. And anytime somebody, a lot of old guys, you know, are passing away and they have basements full of tools that they're, their family is willing to just give away for a song, you know, like I've had guys post stuff where they're just like, I got this for like $500. I'm like, what? That's like a $3,000 planer. And, uh, you know, those are rare, but for people that are really looking for the deals, you will find them, right? It's like seek and ye shall find. But a lot of people that are just, you know, I can't find it on Amazon. It's like, no, eh, this is woodworking. You're going to have to dig a little deeper to find some good woodworking tools, right? Go flea markets, Anybody who lives out on the East Coast, um, they're super lucky because there's so many tools out there, right? West Coast is a lot scarce. We only have more new tools. You can find great old tools on the East Coast if you go to these flea markets and stuff like that. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I'm a no excuses kind of guy, right? So it's like sometimes people are like, I can't afford it. I'm like, work a weekend. Um work a weekend to make an extra $400 and then go buy the hand plane kind of a thing, right? Take some extra shifts, takes on some side jobs. Uh, a lot of times trying to make it do with like your janky um, Home Depot tools is you're going to spend way more time uh, trying to use crappy quality tools when it's like spend a, a month or a couple months working weekends and then go buy good quality tools and you'll actually just enjoy your life way more right so this is kind of like how do you frame you know are you unable to find another source of income or are you unable to work a few extra hours uh, i think a lot of people could find a way to kind of get creative right to solve their problems and so the, that's what we're all about here embracing cre about. creativity just embrace the creative nature in in finding ways to get tools use tools and build furniture um, quick question. I mean, we talked, we're talking about the router sled and the slab. We talked about dust collection. I just wanted to touch on this. You've got this, uh, set up in your shop. If you look to the left of your table saw, uh, explain what that is, that garbage can. And you've got your dust collections hooked up to planer table saw, but explain that. Cause I think that's a pretty handy tip. Yeah, that's a very necessary tool. That's called a chip separator. So essentially it's like this little plastic lid that go, that fits on most gar garbage cans. And um, so the hose from the planer goes onto one port and then the hose that goes to your dust collection, which is in that plywood closet over my uh, shoulder on the right there or whatever. Um, it's like if you're running boards through a planer, you're going to fill up your dust collection bag in like minutes, literally minutes, uh, whereas that is a chip separator. So the chips go into that garbage can, they fall down to the bottom, and then the air continues to circulate through, creating the suction, but the chips are not getting sucked up into the main line and going into your dust collection. So you're keeping your dust collection bags empty, and you're just filling that garbage can. Now, if you fill that garbage can full, then it starts sucking it into your thing, but you gotta just keep dumping that garbage can every time it gets about two thirds full. You gotta 
lift the lid and be like, okay, we got to dump it now, right? So it's just way easier to dump a garbage can than to try and take those plastic bags off of like a dust collection thing or like pull it out of the closet. It's just way more work. So that is a huge time saver in the fact that I'll just keep a bunch of empty garbage cans by that thing. And then I just pop the lid off and just keep offloading the sawdust into my garbage cans, right? That are really easy and handy, right? So that the chip separator, you can get those a lot of different places. Um, any kind of wood, wood, wood craft, Lee Valley, uh, tool specialties, you know, tool focused stores will, will have that kind of stuff, right? Dust collection equipment. Nice. Um, let's just quickly talk about uh, removing twist from, uh, I've got a video I'll pull up here. Removing twist from a board. I mean, this video clip here you are actually doing it by hand. So just kind of explain kind of the fundamental process and thought process that you have through this. Yeah, so you can see what I'm doing with the straight edge. I'm going corner to corner on a diagonal like that. That'll typically kind of show you where your twist, your high points are. Um, and then you want to knock down those areas um, because plain like if you don't take the twist out completely on a joiner or like in this case this board was too wide to fit on my joiner but i'm not sure what i was building here but i i couldn't cut the board narrower right um or else I just have... front door. oh yeah that's for my door right so i was like oh i need like 10 inches wide but i need it to be you know straight and and flat and so I had to do it by hand before because the planer will not remove twist. Like it will to a really small degree. Um, but essentially as you're running a board through the planer, there's these rollers in there that are on springs that are pushing down with a lot of pressure to hold it, the board steady while it goes through the blades. And so a lot of times twist can be like flexed out of a board. And when you have a big steel roller on it, it's just going to push the flex out or it's just going to kind of like, it'll lift up the one end of the board when the, roller grabs it and then as it goes through the roller the other end will drop down so the, the twist will still be in the board when it goes through the planer um so you so what i'm doing here is i'm just flattening one side of the board getting it flat and then i put that side down on the planer because the blades are on the top and then that'll the blade the planer will then you know flatten the top perfectly to match the bottom right yeah. so i was in this case, I was just like, yeah, I, I think I had about an eighth of an inch or there was just this weird twist, right? And you can tell twist by typically, I, if the board's short enough, you put it on a, like your tabletop of your table saw where you got a, a machined cast top, it's going to be really flat. And then you kind of like push on the corners, right? And you'll feel it. Like if it doesn't move, then it's flat. If it tips and does little bubbles and teeter tars, then you have twist in your board, right? So then you need to flip it over and do what I'm doing here and find those high spots, plane them down, keep checking with a straight edge or keep flipping it over and putting it on your table saw and kind of touching the corners to see if it's still got that teeter-totter kind of thing going on. So, so yeah, I do that. The other thing you can do is with an aluminum level or that in that case, I'm using a straight edge and it's aluminum is you can, aluminum will kind of like scuff wood and, and almost leave like a pencil kind of like mark because it's like a soft metal. Um, and so a lot of times if you take aluminum, like a level that's not painted, uh, but has like a raw aluminum edge, and if you kind of just rub it back and forth over a piece of wood, all of a sudden you'll see these little like gray scuff marks where it's like, oh, there's my high point, right? And so then you can just plane that down. Oh, no, the little aluminum shavings might damage your blades. Um, it's not that big a deal. Resharpen your blade, okay? Um, so, so, yeah, like people obsess over little things so I get a kick out of it um, so yeah like that's one way to do it or you can also even take if if you're if you're not getting like enough visibility if you take a pencil like a construction pencil it's got a thick lead and you just sketch um, on your straight edge like draw a pencil along the whole thing and then when you flip that over and rub that on the wood all that graphite or pencil lead or whatever you call it will will come off onto the wood as well and show you like where high points and stuff are rubbing and then you can plane that down that way so it's just a very like um it's not complicated right but it, it, it does require like you being in tune to being like okay like i'm gonna take this part down and then that part down and you kind of have to like do the math and like visualize in your head like okay if i take off too much here is that going to make the twist worse or less and you really like 
it, concepts will always make sense when somebody's talking about them, or maybe they don't. And then, but when you go and apply it, you go, "Oh, okay, now I get what he's saying." Because you just had to problem solve your way through it and figure it out. Yeah. Right. And so, woodworking is not a really rocket science thing. Sure, there's a lot of information out there, but like the basics are the basics, and and there's a thousand ways to skin a cat, but you know, nine hundred of those ways is going to work and 100 or not and you're very likely going to experience many of those ways as you try and figure it out but it's like people get so panicked well, like is there one way to do it it's like no just go and uh, apply take the tool and put it on the wood and you will find that your learning curve goes up dramatically as opposed to somebody who just continues to consume watch videos watch videos watch videos and they're like okay now i think i finally know enough uh, the guy that just watched maybe five or six videos instead of 50 and went, and then went and started putting the tools to the wood, he's way ahead of you because he's already developing muscle memory. He's already getting like real hands-on uh, learning, which is just going to be, it's going to stick with you and and make you a better woodworker way faster, right? So that's what I always grind people. I'm like, just get out there, put your damn tool on the wood. And you're going to find out if your tool is sharp enough right away, right? Oh, how, how do I sharpen my tools? It's like sharpen with what you got. Put a tool to the wood. Does it work? Great. Keep going. Uh, does it not work? Okay, go back. And now you need to learn a little bit more sharpening, right? But it's like you constantly need to check. Like, am I learning stuff that I need right now? Or am I just procrastinating because I'm too intimidated to actually go and just start woodworking? Like, just friggin' start. Just get on it. Use whatever tool you got. That's right. Um, so, I mean, we're kind of getting to the end here, run out of time. We should talk about drying lumber, probably. I think a lot of people, I get insane amounts of, of questions about, like, seasoning and drying lumber. And so okay. there's just a few simple rules of thumb for that, okay? Um, if you're air drying lumber, meaning you've cut a tree down or you've got wood fresh from the mill, it's called green wood or unseasoned wood, which means there's an insane amount of moisture still in that wood. You do not want to be building with green wood, okay? Maybe timber frame, a lot of timber framers will work with green wood, but you're going to get lots of shrinking and checking and twisting and moving, but that doesn't really affect the frame overall. Furniture building, completely different. You can't build with green wood unless you want it to look like, you know, something, you know, <laughs> Dick Prennicky, like log furniture from like, you know, out in the bushes kind of stuff. Like you're not actually looking for tight joinery. Um, so your wood has to be dried. So air dried, there's a rule of thumb, it's one inch per year. So if you have a two inch thick board that you just milled and you're drying it by air drying it, which means you're just stacking it up in a barn somewhere or under cover out of the rain, uh, it's gonna be two years. You know, four inch thick, four years kind of a thing, right? So um, wood takes a long time to release that moisture. There's other ways, kiln drying will speed that up. But even then, I find like after a kiln drying, you still want to let that wood sit in your dry shop for a couple of months before you use it because kiln drying will work to a certain degree, but your moisture content needs to be like 12% or less. And that's like high end. Typically, 10 or 9% or less is, is like now you're in the safe zone for like no, no visible movement in any of your joinery or loosening of anything once you, cause a lot of times like you're building in your shop, which may say not be heated and the furniture is beautiful and it's perfect. And then you take it into your house, which is like nice and warm and dry. And you're going to notice little hairline, you know, cracks if you have like through tenons and stuff like that, typically on like larger scale joinery, not so much small stuff. Um, but yeah, like you can notice some visible changes just going from like a unheated shop to a heated home, right? And so I find like what I that's why I heat my shop because I'm like I just don't want to have those issues. I'd rather pay to heat my shop um, and not have you know cracks or any kind of like shifts in the wood at all. So air drying, right? It's a year per inch. Uh, the moisture content you want is twelve percent at the most, uh, ideally ten percent or less and uh, get a good quality moisture meter. That's the only way to do it, right? You can get ones that you have to stab these little pins into the wood, they work. You can get cheap ones on Amazon, but typically the only place you can you want to stab holes into the wood um, is at the end grain, and you're always going to get a different moisture reading at end grain because mm -hmm. a lot of the moisture escapes through the end grain, right? So 
if you're measuring at the end of the board, that's not going to be an accurate reading for what the moisture is throughout the whole board. So I find like the 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 pinless ones that where they they scan the wood with some sort of magnetic frequency or whatever. Um, those are the best, and they're also the most expensive, right? So I use Wagner meter, um, which is going to be about four hundred dollar meter. Um, but if you're a woodworker and you plan on doing this consistently, like you need to have a good quality moisture meter to know. Um, the other option is, that, and that's like if you're milling your own wood or drawing your own slabs and stuff like that. If you're buying hardwood from a hardware hardwood supplier, it's all going to be kiln dried to moisture content of like. 12% or less already. And so you know it's stable. So if you're like, I don't have 400 bucks to spend on a moisture meter, well then just go buy your hardwood from a hardwood retailer, which is all in a warehouse that's dry and stuff like that. But you still wanna, you still wanna season that wood in your shop, right? It's like when you're laying a hardwood floor for anybody who's worked in the trades, they always bring the hardwood in, even if it's engineered hardwood, and you bring it in and you leave it in the space where it's gonna be going, right? In the home for typically a couple weeks before you start laying the floor because you want to give the wood time to acclimatize to that environment. Same in your shop, right? So if you're planning on building a workbench um, and I've broken this rule a few times and it's not going to make or break a project, but ideally um, you bring your hardwood in to your shop like three weeks before you actually start working with the wood. And then any little minute changes will have taken place by then. And then by the time you start working the wood, you're not going to run into any weird warpage and stuff like that issues after you've planed and, and dimensioned all your lumber. Right. So woodworking is like one of these things where it's like people like get excited and they're like, ah, I'm jumping into it. Let's go. And, um, it, woodworking is more one of those slow and steady, you know, tortoise in the hair type thing. Like you just have to, take your time, right? And, and mill these slabs up and then you get super excited, but you have to be like, I'm not using these slabs for a few years. And then you put them away in the barn and just let them dry and then, and then keep milling wood or keep acquiring wood and keep storing it away wherever you can find. And then you'll find eventually, like after a couple of years of being a little wood hoarder, that you now actually, oh, I can use these slabs. They're ready now. And then you go back and you start pulling stuff out and you're like, okay, this wood's ready and this wood's ready or that wood needs another year or whatever. And you kind of have to like, you have to think long-term, right? You got to have a long strategy here of like several years. Like, okay, I'm going to have a joiner this year and then I'm going to have a table saw. Well, you'd get a table saw first, but then probably a joiner, right? Then a planer and then a bandsaw. And, and you just kind of pace yourself as you go right if you look at that video where you're showing me in my build my workbench like my shop is like nearly empty i just had the main tools there now we look at my shop right five years later you know i've done the tool wall and i've acquired more tools and I, you know i've been slowly just chipping away at it that's what woodworking is right it's like it's a lifestyle it's not just like something that you can turn on and jump into and be going at it like in six months like you can get a good start for sure but you're still going to be like this is a, a kind of like a lifelong endeavor if you truly like want to make stuff with your hands like you're going to have to be investing in your tools in yourself in your muscle memory through practice and it's going to take years right they say five to ten thousand hours to master something you're not going to get the same results in, in a thousand hours that you are in five and ten thousand hours right so yeah start putting in the hours right you know just watching videos is not i wouldn't quantify that as like experienced or t you know time on the tools time on the tools is always going to be your number one priority if you want to become a good woodworker awesome well i want to just thank you jesse samurai carpenter for joining us i just have a couple things to close off here um so this session was with the Samurai Carpenter. We had a couple sessions already this week with Jimmy Dresta, John Peters. I did one yesterday on project assembly. Um, if you're a beginner and you want to get in the shop and get going, we have a, uh, a project we're going to be going over tomorrow. And this is, this is something that is just to get you in the shop and, and making something. Um, so we built this uh, farmhouse desk. It is more of a DIY project, so it's not at all anything like what you'd see the Samurai Carpenter build, but it's going to get you in the shop. Uh, it's going to help you learn some basic things. Uh, if you want to join me tomorrow uh, in the private Facebook group, which uh, there's a link below on how you can get, get into that with the Maker's Teacher Series, um, we're going to teach you how to build this desk. We're going to give you free plans, and that's happening 
tomorrow as as well as into the weekend we're going to do do some more lives here so um you can join me for that uh but you have to be in that private facebook group the makers teachers series uh aside from this exciting news today jesse we are launching with the makers mob our, mm. uh, oh, yeah, look at that, that's oh. great you're a crafty little bugger, eh? You still, oh, still hey. got some games, still got some woodwork yeah, game yeah. there, eh? You can yeah. sell that at IKEA. I know. <laughs> or on, on uh, uh, like a marketplace. Oh, yeah. So, so, so anyway, yeah, join me tomorrow if you want to learn how to do that. You get free plans and all that. Um, but like I was saying, Jesse, Black Friday is coming up. And the Makers Mob, we are doing our annual Black Friday sale. Um, if you're on YouTube, there's a link in the, in the description for our annual Black Friday sale. It's just launching today. Uh, you can join us, Jesse. Just give a little what's up about the it, it's Mobs. a It's a socially distance approved gift for any loved one or for yourself. You know, the world is going weird out there and everyone's got to hunker down and do the right thing. And why not hunker down with some sharp tools and some sharp looking brethren and sistren out there? Uh, so, yeah, it's, I, I personally love the group so much just for the community of it. Uh, so if you're looking for like a – I know there's an insane amount of, of Facebook groups and communities as far as DIY maker stuff. I find the difference between our group and, and most of the other ones, the free ones – is that you just get a lot of riffraff, a lot of time wasters, a lot of goofballs, whereas ours is very focused on like sharing information, sharing ideas, you know, insight, lessons learned, very positive, very like we're not ripping each other or, you know, being negative about anybody's work, no matter what your skill level is, we're very positive, we're very encouraging and, um, which I, I was quite delighted by a lot of people that joined just be like, holy crap, everybody here is just so like, yeah, let's do this. Let's help each other. Let's share, you know, information. It's not an ego type thing. We're just, we're just, sorry, someone was calling me there. Um, so, so that's what I love so much about the community is like, you can come on, you have access to myself, Jimmy Duresta, John Peters, uh, Liam Hoffman, Frank Howard, Neil Paskin, like a lot of really talented makers, as well as we just have a lot of no-namers who are even more talented than, than many of us, like maker guys who are influencers and have followings. Like there's some old guys on there that are, are just take, taking us to school, right? But they're not into, you know, making videos, but they'll share pictures on their phone of all the awesome stuff they're building and carving. And they're just so happy to be able to share their knowledge with people, and so I find that uh, our Facebook community is, is top notch, as well as the Makers Mob site has a new um, community aspect to it, so you can ask questions there if you're not into Facebook, and we're responding to you, right? So anytime during the waking hours, if people are tagging me with questions, tagging my name on the Facebook group or on the Makers Mob page, I'm out there, I'm answering, doing little video stuff, anything to help you get your projects done, right? So if you're a go-getter and you wanna you know, have access to to the knowledge that you need to get stuff done this is like a great great place f for that right so as far as uh, return on investment if you're truly invested in in learning a craft um, you're probably not going to find too many other communities out there that kind of have the same value ratio that we do yeah so on top of the community i mean the site we've got over 80 projects plans tutorials like some of these tutorials are like three to five hours in depth for all of your big projects, your your kind of most popular projects, your workbench, uh, your shop stool, uh, we're working on the um, the rocking garage, chair, garage doors, yeah, garage doors. It's all it's it's all on there. Your side tables, um, and then Jimmy Dress has got a bunch of tutorials in there. John Peters, Frank Howarth does wood turning, John Heiss, uh, Liam Hoffman, some blacksmithing in there. Oh yeah, John uh, Heiss is in there too. I keep forgetting about him. Yeah, John Heiss has got some phenomenal stuff in there. Uh, Neil Paskin uh, has some great stuff in there too. So it's just a great community. If you guys want to get on a Black Friday sale, this is our biggest sale of the year. Uh, the link is in the description below. If you're on the Facebook group, it's in the uh, description above, I think, the video. Um, and you can get that today. And it's, uh, it's shutting down Monday night. So... Um, there you go. You guys, you guys can jump on that. And then again, 
If you want to join me tomorrow again, 12 o'clock uh, Pacific Standard Time, 3 o'clock Eastern Time again, we're going to go through that desk, farmhouse desk build for people who are beginners and want something just to kind of get them going. If you've never built a project or just starting out, uh, we're going to go through that build. So, Sam Carpenter, Jesse, thank you for joining me today. Hey, that was fun. I'm just excited to see like so many people that are are wanting to jump in and build stuff with their hands. It's encouraging in this day and age of automation that people are like, you know what, there's something missing in this life and using our hands to create the things that we need is actually a very, very fulfilling, beautiful experience in life. So it's it's super encouraging to see all these these new faces and names out here, man. I hope to see some of you guys in on our group and we can just continue to build relationships and build awesome stuff. That's right. Uh, so we have a code word in the private Facebook group for the Makers Teacher Series. Today's code word is the Samurai Carpenter. Oh, That's yeah. That's what you got to... Yeah, seriously, the Samurai Carpenter, and also we're going to... Highly out, secretive. Yeah, we're going to send out an email uh, in a little bit, probably an hour or a bit, with your homework for the day, something that we want to get you to do. Um, uh, so look out for that email as well. Until tomorrow, same time, 3 o'clock Eastern, 12 o'clock Pacific. We'll see you guys later. We're going to sign awesome. off here. Fun hanging, guys. Till next time, Samurai out. See ya.